Today I'd like to add value to the, the price forecast that we publish in our agricultural commodity forecast uh, publication um, by looking at the robust of our current set of kind of low price forecasts uh, to some supply shocks uh, that, that, that could happen in the next, next few years. I'll also be introducing the rest of today's session by looking at the kind of risks that periods of persistent low prices create and whether or not it's better to handle those through government intervention or industry-led innovation in marketing. Now, starting off with the price forecast, look, over the next two to three years, we're forecasting uh, wheat and coarse grain prices to recover somewhat from the low levels that they reached recently due to very high level levels of global production. And where they can, farmers both here and around the world have responded to these low prices by substituting towards more profitable crops, uh, particularly oil seeds. And this has had the effect, of course, of driving oil seeds prices down as well, and we're expecting that to continue over the next few years. Even the price of barley, for which stocks have recently hit uh, a long-term historical low, is being kept low by abundant stocks of, of, of corn in, in world markets. And the story is similar with, uh, for canola, with record production uh, and stocks of soybean around the world. The current trend of low prices in world grain markets is almost entirely due to expanding global production capacity but also a series of favourable seasons. In particular, there was a, a, a very unusual coincidence of great growing conditions in the northern and southern hemisphere growing seasons of 2016 and 2017. And at the same time, there is a, a growing long-term trend of increasing production capacity in regions such as the Black Sea, uh, and this is just inherently causing uh, greater competition in, in a lot of Australia's traditional export markets. One of the problems we face as a, as a, as a forecaster and doing five-year forecasts is that despite advances in technology, we still really can't reliably forecast seasonal climate conditions beyond the current growing season. And because of that, the, the simplest and most transparent assumption we can make is that average seasonal conditions will prevail in those seasons beyond the current season and that yields will be close to their long-term trend value. Now, we know that's not a fabulous assumption, but that's about the best we can do at the moment, given current technology. And, and yet we know that, that inherent uncertainty in global grains market is almost entirely driven by variability in production. We know that consumption tracks up pretty steadily with growing incomes and, and populations, and that the production variability in grains market is almost entirely due to the effect of climate on yields around the world more so even than the, the price responsiveness of areas planted uh, you know, by farmers as, uh, as relative prices change. So when we're, when we're you know, faced with this situation, we know that, uh, that a, a low price you know, scenario is a, is a fairly sort of boring forecast. And we also know that, that, that there is likely to be changes over the next five years, the timing of which we can't reliably, we can't reliably set. And we, we also know that, that you know, because of that, that that current low price situation for grains markets, it's a, it's a fragile view of, of the future. And, and just at the moment, there are three big reasons why we think that sort of forecast is particularly fragile and needs to be kind of enhanced by a little bit of scenario analysis. Firstly, we know that international trade, that the international trade that sets our world prices is dominated by two or three major exporters. And this means that a supply shock in any one of those exporters could cause a significant disruption to, to, to supplies and, and a, a significant rise in price. And as I've just been talking about, the other thing that's, that's occurred is that, that major exporting countries across all three commodity groups have had a run of unusually high yield, yielding years, uh, particularly in 2016-17. And, and, and this coincidence of exceptional growing conditions in, in regions as diverse as Eastern Europe, Northern America, Southern America, and, and here in Australia is, is just very unusual. So, so unusual that we know, despite our forecast um, uh, barrier uh, to that, that it's you know, very unlikely to be sustained over five years. And while we can't reliably 
you know, forecast these supply shocks. You know, we know that in history, uh, those long periods of, of great production, can, great seasonal conditions haven't persisted. And so, you know, we need to think about what the, the counterfactual scenario is. The other thing that's going on is that uh, for some time now, scientists have been telling us that our climate change is going to make our climate more variable. And we're starting to see that now in things like our national average wheat yields. So when we take, for example, the 118 years of yield data that we have since Federation, and we look at the, the deviations from trend and put that in a, in a probability distribution, we can see that the three biggest deviations from trend have all occurred in the, in the 15 years since 2002-03. Our climate is getting more variable and our crop yields are getting more variable. Now we can get a sense of how robust our current forecasts are by running uh, uh, so some, some scenarios. And in particular, we've run a scenario here where yields fall below current trends to a level that, they, that has occurred in around about 15% of years since, uh, since 2000. If we do this, and if we do this for a, a single year, just assuming that for the top three exporters, yields fall to this level across the three commodity groups of coarse grains, wheat, and, and oil seeds, uh, we're going to assume that that happens only in the year 2018-19. And even when we get that, that single year shock, it's just enough to disrupt supplies and reduce stocks over that period to kick commodity prices up quite a lot over that, over that period. And we haven't, in this scenario, even modelled a supply response where farmers increase or decrease you know, supplies, you know, areas planted, etc., in response to those, uh, those price changes. If we were to do that, we'd probably find that the increase in, in cereal prices means less substitution towards oil seeds, lower oil seed production, for example, and hence higher oil seed prices than, than are shown here. So the point I want to make is, with production high and high stocks in the world at the moment, uh, and, and, and the low prices that flow from that, you know, this, this is a fairly fragile state of, of, of world grain markets and probably not a great state on which to base major investment or policy decisions. And, I, and yet the problem is that whenever we have persistent periods of low prices in our commodity markets, it just seems inevitable that governments come under pressure to intervene in markets in some way. Some of the interventions listed up here certainly do have the potential to make the, the, the operation of markets more efficient but not all of these, these uh, potential inter interventions do. And certainly we know as economists that these interve interventions can only realise benefits if there is something wrong with markets that they correct. If there isn't a problem with markets that these interventions correct, then there is no benefit here to offset the administration costs to consumers and, and taxpayers or the reporting and regulatory burdens that are imposed on, on farm businesses and other in parts of the industry along the value chain. And I guess the ultimate thing that we know as a small price-taking exporter is that none of these government interventions can really do much to change the world's supply and demand balance that determines our, determines our export prices. There's something else going on here too, which I think is also contributing to, to some background calls and some minority calls here for government intervention. And that's some things that are, that are to do with a, the broad label of globalisation. And in particular, there's a simmering debate happening, and, and I see it all the time in, in the things that I'm asked to comment on and provide advice on, simmering debate about whether vertical integration is a good thing or a bad thing for Australian farm businesses. One view is that vertical integration concentrates market power further along the value chain and, and is therefore a disadvantage and a bad thing for farm businesses. Others argue that the, the information and communication technologies that come with globalisation actually empower smaller businesses right along the value chain to interact on a much more equal footing with, with larger businesses. And it also seems that some of the apparent disadvantages of vertical integration are offset by other opportunities. So, for example, the, the falling use and participation in some spot markets and hence the, the falling volume of just market reporting from those markets is often set 
offset by the commercial advantages of contracting in vertically integrated supply chains and the flow of information that, that occurs along those, uh, along those value chains. And look, it's not even clear that vertical integration is happening as uniformly throughout grains value chains as some commentators have recently, recently suggested. Or in fact, that it is actually affecting negatively the, uh, the marketing options of farm businesses. So for example, while we undoubtedly have fewer small farm businesses, so post deregulation uh, of the wheat industry in, in uh, wheat marketing in the grains industry, Specialisation has led to the creation of, of more uh, small to medium businesses further along the value chain, particularly in manufacturing. And, and manufacturing for the domestic market still constitutes about 25 to 30 per cent of, of grain markets. And while we can see that the, the number of, uh, of grain traders, uh, you know, the, of large businesses particularly, uh, well, right through the value chain hasn't changed particularly much, deregulation has certainly encouraged the, uh, the, the smaller to medium businesses and the medium sized businesses right through the value chain. And that includes the domestic, the, the storage and, and wholesaling businesses that serve both the domestic and, and international markets. We also know something about the structure of the grains industry that we have far more uh, grain traders than we've ever had before uh, in this country. And deregulation has particularly encouraged the proliferation of small to medium businesses that complement the, the services offered by, and the rapidly evolving services offered by the larger bulk handling companies. And look, you know, despite the adverse, the suggested, uh, alleged adverse effects of uh, market consolidation and vertical integration, we certainly know that a, a much smaller number of farm businesses is producing more and more grain each year. So when faced with these sort of periods of, of low Persistent, you know, persistently low prices, we kind of have to ask ourselves a couple of, couple of questions. What, what is likely to work best? What's the best strategy for dealing this? Are there, are there government interventions that, that might impose costs and have at best kind of doubtful, doubtful kind of benefits, particularly in terms of changing price? Uh, or should we rely on industry innovation you know, that, that has much more potential to improve our, our long-term global competitiveness? And particularly looking at, at interventions that, that pose the question that are farm businesses and, 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 and traders right through the value chain, is that an adversarial relationship or is there a collaboration that can occur in which we maximise value and, uh, uh, and become uh, much more uh, competitive together across the value chain? And look, that's the question that this, uh, that this session is set up to, uh, to answer. As, as Steve said, uh, John is going to uh, start off by addressing this question from the perspective of an a innovative farm business in Western Australia, before passing on to, uh, to Chris, who's going to talk about the, the same issues, from the, but from the perspective of a small to medium grain trading business on the, the New South Wales and Victoria border. And then we're going to hear from the big end of town with uh, Tim Krause, uh, giving us the perspective of, of Viterra, an innovative uh, bulk handling company in, in South Australia. So thanks very much. Um, I look forward to uh, the panel discussion afterwards. And, and also, please do come and, and meet us at the end of the session. I, I hope to catch up with, you as, with as many of you as possible. Thanks very much.